You hear that music in the background? Oh right, because this question has to do with Star Trek. One of my favorite show, actually. This is the opening credits. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's continuing mission to explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. As fun as that was, brings back a lot of good memories. It, it's a very optimistic show. It shows how humans, through science and technology, has expanded their frontiers and are sh spreading good moral values, essentially, throughout the galaxy. And, and as they travel the galaxy, they need to get around places really fast, and they have to travel faster than the speed of light. They use this. Um, fictional technology called warp drive. That's what you saw at the end when they sped up really far and got that splash of light. That's they're going faster than light just to meet other aliens basically. And to do that you need a lot of energy. Star Trek tries to make it somewhat credible by proposing that the energy source it uses antimatter as fuel. What is this antimatter then? Back to actual physics now. Antimatter is this type of matter that has the same mass but somehow has the opposite charge. So what you know of as a proton would have a mass of, if you look up from Google, of that much, and then you also have a charge of positive 1.602 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs, whereas an antiproton, the only thing that is opposite is the charge. So everything else looks the same. So you, we sometimes call this the P plus and the P minus, or some other people might use P and then put a dash on it to say that it's the antiproton. The mass is the same, but then the charge is actually negative of that. So that's what antimatter means. Everything is the same except for the charge. However, these antimatter, while they do exist in our world, uh, in various particle accelerator, we see that all the time. It's not that exotic, but it has this property of as soon as it meets its counterpart in regular matter, so as soon as an antiproton touches a proton, they melt away and give you pure energy. And the energy you get is given by E equals mc squared. So whatever mass you lose, is, that's how much energy you're going to end up releasing. As you imagine, that makes it a very efficient, quote unquote, or at least very dense sort of fuel. By comparison, if you compare it with nuclear power to say power your ship, for every nuclear reaction, you only lose about 0.1% of your mass. Even a little more in the future, fusion or what happens in the stars, you might lose 1% of your mass and convert to um, E equals mc squared. Whereas if you have antimatter and matter, you can annihilate a hundred percent of the mass and you get lots and lots of energy. So that's the whole spiel about antimatter. So that's where you can imagine if you're going to travel for a long time in space and you don't want to carry super, super huge amounts of fuel, carrying antimatter might be a very good way of making sure you have energy as you travel around the galaxy. But then there's a catch, right? Remember how I said as soon as an antiproton touches a proton, they will annihilate and basically explode and give you a lot of, lot of energy. So then, like, what would a fuel tank of this antimatter stuff look like. The antimatter basically can't touch any normal matter and you can't make the 
fuel container also out of antimatter because then you can't touch the fuel container. So the only real way to do it is to trap these antimatter because they're charged by using a magnetic field. So they go around in the circle and they don't fly off and touch anything. Let me draw that out for you a little bit. So you can have a container in here. So these are made of regular matter. And then you have a charged particle of antimatter inside. You expose the whole thing with magnetic field. So let's say in this case, I put a magnetic field of a certain strength that goes into the page. So there's my B. And I set this guy moving that away. So that's my V. Then what's going to happen? Well, then we're going to have a magnetic force on it and using our right hand rule, remembering that this guy has a charge of negative elementary charge. So it has a negative charge. So we have to remember that QV goes this way. That's where my thumb goes. Put my index finger along with the magnetic field into the page. Then I will see that I'll get an FB like that. What that does, because this force is perpendicular to my velocity, thinking back to the uniform circular motion, this is going to help the antiproton curve around in a circle. When it gets over here, there's my V. You do the same thing and you find that the magnetic field continues to be perpendicular. And so you're going to make this thing go in a circle. And as long as it goes in this circle and it's nice and happy, this antimatter is floating around in space and it's not touching the container at all. That is probably made of matter. In fact, given that, you don't even need a container wall at all. They just swirl around inside. So if you draw a free body diagram of this particle, the only force on it is, of course, your FB. And if you do some forces, that's going to give you acceleration. And in this case, my acceleration is my centripetal acceleration because you go in a circle. So that's V squared over R. My total force, the magnitude of anyway, because all the directions have been worked out, is your FB equals QV, all magnitudes here b sine theta and in this case we make sure that theta is equal to 90 to get our biggest bang for the buck q v b and sine theta therefore equals 1 so you have m v squared over r the v kind of cancels out and to solve for b we just divide q over Subbing everything in, we looked up the masses already. And this is the absolute value sign of 40 antiproton as a negative charge, but all we care about is the magnitude anyhow. And then it has a radius of 2 meters. Calculator work gives us 2.61 Tesla, and that's the answer. Now, 0.261 Tesla sounds like quite a lot, but in fact, it's not that impossible anymore. We are almost quite routinely have magnets up to, say, one Tesla, say, in a MRI machine, if you've heard of in the hospital, magnetic resonance imaging, or specific specific places where we study antimatter, say um, at Triumph, right out at UBC up the road from us, they create antimatter and they precisely store it in these kind of con configuration using magnetic fields of the strength it is. So it's, it's not a super common thing, but at the same time, it's very possible and people do it every single day in selected laboratories around the world. So at least that one part, the future is already here. Warp speed, we're still working on that one.